So uh, I, I will introduce the first speaker. Our first sp speaker today is Dominic Standage, and he is a Marie Curie Senior Research Fellow at the University of Birmingham, UK, and he's currently on pandemic leave at Queen's University, Canada. So Dominic uses modeling and data analysis methods to investigate the neural basis of cognitions and consciousness. And um, Dominic, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Meng Sen. <clears throat> Okay, um, I'm going to talk about uh, differential or differential modular dynamics and marmoset cortex during conscious and unconscious states. So, a bare bones and perhaps cowardly definition of consciousness is that it's the ability to sense and respond to stimuli. As such, a great way to investigate consciousness is through the use of general anesthetics, which disrupt that ability temporarily. The cellular effects of general anesthetics are quite well understood and they have to be to be used in medical practice. But how those cellular effects play out at the large scale level of brain networks is not so well understood. A great way to investigate those large scale brain effects or network effects in combination with anesthetics is through the use of neuroimaging, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. So in this study, four marmosets, so little new world monkeys, were scanned, were put in, in an MRI scanner in two conditions, when they were awake and when they were under the influence of the anesthetic isoflurane. In each condition, they were scanned six times for 20 minutes each. The rough overview of the methodology <clears throat> is we have 116 cortical regions that we're recording from, and we see these time series. The nodes here are, are, are brain regions under this parcellation scheme. So we'll look at, we'll try to construct brain networks in one minute time windows, They're W1, W2, W3, and so forth. And so what we do is for each pair of regions, we calculate their, the co-variation of their hemodynamic response, and then slide the window over 20 times. And what that yields is a multi-slice or temporal network, where in each time slice, we can see these whole brain, or in this case, whole sort of monolithic cortical networks, or in, 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 in these maps, Again, the nodes are regions, and so yellow is high covariation, blue is low care variation. And we're interested in particular in the modular structure. So modularity refers to subnetworks. So you know, we, we characterized by strong or, or dense connectivity within the modules and weak or sparse connectivity between them. So if we look at the schematic here, we've got, you know, for each window, we have a, a it's called a modular partition. We've got four color-coded modules. If you look at the red module, for example, it has four members and it has six and it has four, then it has three. So the, 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 there's a, a reconfiguration of this modular partition that goes on in time. And in recent work, including some of our own um, in preparation, there, there's evidence for the statistics of this reconfiguration correlating with performance on cognitive tasks. And so we wanna ask, do, do these modular dynamics differ um, between consciousness and unconsciousness? So the first hypothesis we tested is that cortical modular reconfiguration is less coordinated during unconsciousness. So why do we hypothesize that? The short answer is that it's a prediction of an earlier study by our group um, where we looked at similar measures of modular dynamics um, from uh, across depths of unconsciousness, but not looking in the conscious state. A slightly longer explanation is if you think of functional connectivity as a dynamic system riding on the underlying structural connectivity, well, if anesthetics weaken 
functional connectivity and there's evidence that they do. And if that weakening renders the functional connectivity sort of more similar to it sort of sinks into the underlying structural connectivity, it impoverishes the dynamics. And then so the, the dynamics don't support groups of brain regions forming modules together in a coordinated manner. And so the first measure that, 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 we, that we take um, in relation to, to this hypothesis um, is, is referred to as disjointedness. So it's simply the number of times for each region that that region changes modules by itself. So at the time it changes, no other region changes with it. And we divide that by the number of transitions between windows and average over the regions. And so in the awake condition here in the dark shade, these are the within subject means. So for each monkey across all the scans, this measure disjointedness, we see it in the awake condition, the anesthetic condition and the light shade. And you can see that for each monkey, we have these pairwise increases in disjointedness, this haphazard uncoordinated reconfiguration. And the dashed line just draws your attention to the fact that all of the anesthetic data are separate from all of the, the awake data. So it's sort of an intuitive, if not formal inverse of this measure is referred to as cohesion strength. So it's the number of times for each region that it changes modules together with other regions. And that's relative to the number of, of transitions and it's weighted by the number of regions it's cha it changes with. And so, you know, this captures coordinated reconfiguration. We see that in the awake state, you know, we have higher cohesion strength than in the anesthetic and than under anesthetic. So, so far two for two, sorry, one for one in terms of hypotheses. So the second hypothesis we tested is that cortical networks become fragmented during unconsciousness. And the long and the short of it is there's a fairly large body of data that characterizes unconsciousness this way. Um, modularity is fragmentation. It's subsectioning of, of networks um, within larger networks. And so, yeah, we can count the number of modules that we identify and have them over the scans and we see that we have more modules um, and so greater fragmentation in the anesthetic or under anesthetic. So next hypothesis is that, uh, and I, I can't see it here, uh, fragmentation is characterized by hierarchical network disintegration. All right, so there's a little bit more to unpack here. <clears throat> well, first thing we need to do um, is to identify subnetworks across these modular partitions as the modules ebb and flow. We wanna nail down summary structure. Um, and so we simply calculate the probability across all windows, scans and subjects that each pair of regions was together um, in the same module. So that's referred to as a module allegiance matrix. We calculate that matrix in the awake condition. So here we've lined up our regions on the axes. And so, you know, yellow means that, you know, these two regions tended to be together and blue means they tended to be in different modules. So we can then cluster that network or that, that allegiance network, um, grouping like with like, and we see we have significant structure. So this is effectively, these are sort of the, the modules or subnetworks from which the, the, the reconfiguration occurred. Um, it's a nice summary. Um, and so we can project these subnetworks onto brain plots. And we see that we have sensible networks that, that, that are, you know, we have a visual frontoparietal network, a ventrotemporal prefrontal network, and a somatomotor network. The gray blobs in here um, are subcortical um, areas that we didn't record from. So, Fragmentation is characterized by hierarchical network disintegration. So now that we can now, so we've got our clustered module allegiance matrix with our identified networks. We can now cluster, we can take the same clustering solution and impose it on the module allegiance matrix in the anesthetic condition. So if you look, you know, you can sort of eyeball this that you can see the networks are, you look at network two, it seems to be disintegrating. Network three seems to be disintegrating. And as they disintegrate, they sort of smear into one another. So this is the disintegration that we're talking about. We can measure that, we can quantify that observation with a, with, a, with a measure within network integration. It is effectively the sum of regional allegiances. So summing up these weights relative to network size. We see that you know, in network one, three out of four networks show this within network integration, it drops off so that they're disintegrating, not in the fourth monkey. It's not totally clear. Um, but if we look at networks two, and three, you know, you can see that they're disintegrating and that's borne out in, the, in this measure within network integration. 
So we now want to look at the smearing between them. We're going to calculate uh, a measure called between network integration, which is effectively the sum of cross allegiances. Um, so you've got networks one and two here. This is, these are their cross allegiances. And that's relative to their within network integration. And so no, networks one and two relative to, to their, let's call it their baseline, they're not smearing into one another. But clearly networks one and three, they absolutely do begin to smear. You can see it goes from dark blue to lighter blue. Um, we see the same thing between networks two and three. So it's happening in, you know, in most of the networks, but not all. And so finally, we want to address this hierarchical aspect of the disintegration, the, the fragmentation. And so the three networks that we've derived from the modular partitions, um, well, one is a somatomotor motor network. Hierarchically, this is low level. Thanks, Ming Tseng. Um, the ventral temporal prefrontal network is high level. This is a pure association network. This visual frontal parietal network is kind of mixed low high. So one of these networks did not disintegrate clearly. It did not smear into the others um, uh, uniformly. Um, and we'd expect that to be the somatomotor network, but it wasn't. It was the visual frontal parietal network. So that's somewhat surprising um, in, in relation to our previous work where we sort of had a very clear hierarchical delineation of these measures. So perhaps that suggests that, you know, there's a difference in terms of hierarchical fragmentation from consciousness to unconsciousness, as opposed to from shallow unconsciousness to deep unconsciousness. And what we want to do next is sort of dive into the, 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 the hierarchical structure within the networks. And you can see that there is still some structure here, despite this, this disintegration that's going on. So I'll wrap up now. Um, the collaborators in this project are Jason Galavan at Queen's University, Stefan Everling, Yuki Hori, and Rabbi Menon at Western University, both universities in Canada. Uh, these data were recorded by Yuki in Stefan's lab in collaborate, collaboration with Rabbi, and were published earlier this year in, in Cerebral Cortex, and they were kind enough to, to share them with, with Jason and me. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions or comments, uh, there's my email address. Thank you so much for the very interesting talk. Uh, we will wait for uh, people to ask questions. Please post your question to the Q&A session and I will uh, ask them. Um, but while we're waiting, I would uh, ask you something. This is actually very interesting to me. Um, one thing I'm wondering about is whether, um, in EEG, I know that there is a big difference between the sleep and anesthesiology uh, state. So is there, the similar kind of, is the cortical network reconfigured differently during regular sleep rather than... Um... Right. Uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer. I'm actually quite new to consciousness, unconsciousness um, as, as, as a researcher, not as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> principally, you know, the, the, this approach to, to network neuroscience in the area of, of, of consciousness and unconsciousness, you know, you're looking at sleep studies, you're looking at anesthetic studies, um, and some clinical studies with, with, with patients in, in, in persistent vegetative states and un, unresponsive states. Um, I, I, yeah, my impression is that there is a, a, there are, there, there's a lot that's in common, but there's a lot that, that differs. Um, in terms of the hierarchical aspects of these things, I'm pretty sure that in sleep studies, you, you sort of get, um, you know, there's the psychophysical evidence for responsiveness um, that you wouldn't get um, for, under high doses of anesthetic. And the sort of hierarchical breakdown, you know, tends to the lower doses of anesthetics, you, you get the, the, the higher areas of, of, of brain hierarchy sort of begin to fragment first and at higher doses, it sort of cascades down. Um, I think that is generally the case in sort of depths of sleep as well um, that probably aren't as easy to categorize. Um, but I'm pretty sure that, that, uh, that, that there's a, the retained responsiveness is there in sleep um, more so than it would be under anesthesia. But uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I do need to know this literature better. And, and, uh, but I mean, I, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Uh, we have a question coming in. Uh... Has cortical modular reconfiguration be used in other studies as well to characterize different state of consciousness? Uh, so static modularity 
has been, I, I know has been looked at in some anesthetic studies where you take one modular config, configuration. In terms of dynamic modular configura reconfiguration, only our study, to the best of my knowledge, earlier this year with macaque monkeys, um, also in collaboration with Stefan Eberling's group um, and working with Jason, Jason Galdan and I were working with a data set that they were published years ago. Um, and yeah, we looked at you know, dynamic reconfiguration across depths of unconsciousness. They had six dose levels of isofluorine. I'm unaware of any, dynamic mod any other dynamic modular analyses of, of, of unconsciousness. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to move on to...